Anyway, I want to apologize to all of you to the conference and to the hotel staff for the difficulties with my flights yesterday, causing everything to get rearranged. That was very frustrating. But at least it's better than last year where I lost my passport and couldn't go, which was <laughs> quite disastrous. Um, also, I want to apologize about the talk. Talk. Topic. The name. Coming soon. Uh, some people at the conference uh, didn't want to see coming soon sitting on the schedule because it looked like we didn't actually have a talk planned for that. But this is, in fact, the title because we're going to be talking about something, uh, something which is coming soon, which I guess you all know about. Karina, spoiler. And... <sighs> Before we go there, most of you know who I am, Curtis Poe, better known as Ovid. Uh, you probably can't see this. I'm going to toss this up on SlideShare. All around the world. Fr is our company. I'm on Mastodon at the Fossodon.org server. I've been trying out Blue Sky. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I haven't checked the news this morning. Is Twitter still in business? <laughs> <laughs> so my Professional email of it at allaroundtheworld.fr or curtis.poe at gmail.com if you want to contact me or you can find me online pretty easily. It's not that hard, but I put this up here because, well, it's expected. And I really want to thank the sponsors of this conference. I really appreciate them. Uh, Deriv, CPanel, and Grand Street Group, without whom this would be uh, a much worse conference. So let's... So really grateful for them, and check them out. Check out their website. Uh, I think it was uh, Driv who sponsored the breakfast this morning, I think it was. And I think it's cPanel tomorrow, and I haven't checked for the last day. Uh, anyway, question policy for this talk. Generally, for a keynote, people don't ask questions. Uh, they just sit there and they listen. I will say, if there's something I say that you don't understand, go ahead and hold up your hand, because it means I have failed as a speaker. And if you don't understand it, I guarantee someone else doesn't understand it, and someone's going to feel awkward about actually interrupting me. Anything else, please hold it towards the end. If you see my talks before, you know that I usually leave a lot of time at the end of the talk so people can ask questions because I want to be able to have that interaction and to explain the things that I didn't get to cover in the actual talk. And in this particular talk, it's Karina. That's what I was asked to talk about, and that's full feature native object-oriented programming baked into the core language, but I want to take a little detour first. Because this is something which I think is going to it's going to stretch a few minds, and I want to give you an idea of, say, how it might do that. So for me, I started programming back in 1982, I think it was, using BASIC. And then after a while, uh, I had this one particular subsection of code that was taking eight seconds to run, so I taught myself assembler. And from Assembler, uh, I was actually taking C at the university. And that was really a revelation for me. I thought, wow, I've got the power of Assembler with the ease of use of BASIC. <laughs> yeah, the C programmers know why I was an idiot back then. I'm, I mean, I'm still an idiot now, but you don't know why. But back then, you know why. But what really blew my mind about C, the first time I had a major paradigm shift, porting BASIC to Assembler at that time, the BASIC I was using was so feature poor, it was practically a straight port to Assembler, believe it or not. But when I went to C, one of my first thoughts was, how do I program without line numbers? <laughs> or or go to, yes. It was um, certainly, it was a shift for me. I had to learn a new way of thinking how to make this work. So if we look at Perl, this is uh, how you would write uh, lambdas and Perl. Lambda functions come from uh, Alonzo Church's uh, Lambda Calculus back in the 1930s. It was an alternative to, say, uh, a Turing machine. It, the <clears throat> For Turing, what he created was a stateful machine, and the Lambda Calculus was stateless, and it was a different way of approaching the problem. And this is pretty simple. What we have is we're creating... 10 anonymous functions, and all they do is they know their index in the array, and whatever argument they feed them, they can add that to the index. So f of s3 of 4 gets you 7. Pretty straightforward. In Python, same thing looks like this. That's the same code. you got to admit, it's a cleaner syntax. There is one tiny difference. It prints 13, which obviously is not what you want. And there's there's a long discussion about this. It deals with how Python handles scoping and declarations. Uh, but basically, 
Lambda and Python, sometimes you have to know some of the quirks about it in order to be able to use it effectively. You have to understand the language. And this, I'm not saying this is a criticism of Python particularly, uh, though some people are pointing out C-sharp and other languages do this a lot more naturally. But you can fix it pretty easily. But now you have this i equals i. You basically, the anonymous function can now take two arguments instead of one. So it's not quite the same behavior, but it mostly works. Even in Perl, however, it's easy to get wrong if we're doing something like this. Here, we lose dollar underscore in our scope because dollar underscore is not really aliasing to that by the time that's done, and we have an uninitialized value. It's easy stuff to get wrong if you're not familiar with the quirks of a particular language, how it's implemented. Or one of my favorite examples, this is prologue. I like prologue. It's fun. This is, how you re this is one way. This is be a junior assignment for prologue, if they still talk prologue anymore, how you would reverse a list. You've got the base case, because it's all recursive, of an empty list gives you an empty list. And then I won't walk you through how this works, because this is obviously not a prologue tutorial. But this is how people might have written this. And the problem with this, this is sometimes called nrev in prologue. Prologue, they, marry, they, they check their performance with an unfortunate acronym of LIPS, logical inferences per second. And this happens to be ON squared. This is known as the naive reverse, and it is so bad for its performance that it's sometimes used as a very simple benchmark for new prologue compilers. And the way you fix this in prologue, you have an accumulating reverse, which happens to be ON, which again, I won't go into the details about this. This isn't about prologue. It's about me saying you need to learn the idioms of a language. You actually see accumulator functions used behind the scenes in prologue a number of times because you have to know kind of how it works under the hood sometimes, even though the end result's the same. Or Java. This one's because I knew Sawyer just had to have Java in the slides. He was begging for it. Sorry, Sawyer. <laughs> So <clears throat> I used to do Java programming, too. Not a lot, but I was using Swing. And this is how you just get a little pop-up saying, hello, world, in a Swing component. And I thought, you know, that's just a wee bit verbose. Actually, if you do graphics programming, you get a lot of verbosity in there. But I, I always hate the verbosity of Java. It's very painful. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if a mutator could return the invocant? So at the very least, I could chain my mutators and not have to, to type the invocant every time. And I saved a whopping 15 characters. So I called this swing chains, because I'm chaining mutators and swing. <laughs> and I, it actually worked. I had a prototype of this. But it was a very bad idea. Because instead of learning to appreciate what Java offers, I was fighting against the language because I wanted to do it my way. I said, what's natural for Java? But let's get a Perl example. This one is a very, very, very tiny knit, but it's something I think a number of us have probably seen, so I think it's a good one, and it's tiny enough I can fit it in a talk pretty easily. Try catch. In the good old days, you used a block of val instead of a try, and this is broken. It's not guaranteed to be broken. In fact, most of the time it will work until that time that it does not when dollar at happens to evaluate to a false value, and in which case you don't actually get to catch whatever it is the eval had. And a standard idiom for fixing this was eval, we return a true value, and then we have the or do block at the end. I'm not going to go into the details about that. But it's really easy to get the eval block wrong. And it also depends upon which version of Perl you're working on for which version of wrong you happen to get. So eventually, we had try tiny. With that really irritating little semicolon at the end, because those aren't control structures, try and catch our functions, and you're passing an anonymous functions to them in a nice little chain, kind of like the ooh, lambda. Hmm. And that final semicolon might or might not cause a problem if you leave it off. People would leave it off all the time, and then they would add a statement after that, and all of a sudden things mysteriously stop working. You might not even get an error message for it, depending upon how it's set up. Very frustrating. But what we did is we replaced a valor do with that. That's how you do a valor do correctly. <laughs> okay, that's that's not exactly true. It it's jumping through some hoops because it's creating another layer that it's got to work around. But 
Trey Tiny, you can't return from inside the code blocks. Well, you, you can, but they return to the subroutine scope and not returning from the subroutine scope that you're calling it in. Eval actually operates the same way. I see this bug in code a lot. Um, I use the debugger a lot. It's kind of hard to step into those anonymous functions with the debugger unless you remember to set a breakpoint correctly. And that breakpoint is based upon the line number. And if it's all on one line, that gets a little frustrating. I, I hate that. Forgetting the trailing semicolon. There's all sorts of problems with try tiny. Why did it become so incredibly popular? Because it worked. It worked really well. Um, and it was harder to break it than eval or do. And it also looked pretty. It was something you come into the language, oh, try catch, cool. I've got to load an external library. Well, yeah, OK, fine. But it's it was there. And it was easier to do. It was easier to get the correct behavior. And that's more important than the performance issues. So. We have this use try tiny, my result, result, blah, 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 blah. And now we've got feature to pat try. You know, modern pearls have try tiny baked, uh, sorry, have try catch baked in. Feature to pat try will give you try catch back to Perl 514. You need to read the docs, there's some differences. Um, that's a long story I'm not going into. But so now you get a native try catch. You don't need that trailing semi, uh, semicolon anymore because those are not anonymous code refs. That's the nit I was talking about. I find that really annoying. I have to declare the result. I have to assign the result. And then I have to return the result. Or I can just work with how try catch actually works. And I can just return straight from within the try. And I get a smaller subroutine. Another tiny, small example, but one I'm sure a number of you have encountered about getting things working just a little bit better by appreciating the tool that you have rather than trying to write it the way you're used to. And it's not about trying to golf things down. It's not about performance. It's all about we're willing for correctness first. That's what's really important for this. I was asked to talk about Karina. Let's talk about Karina. But I want you to keep that stuff in mind about trying to work with something rather than fighting against it. But we'll, we'll get to that. So 2023, we know we're bringing modern object-oriented programming to the Pearl Core. It is the single biggest change to Perl in three decades. It's, I'm, it took years to get here. I'm really surprised that we got here, to be quite honest. I, I had my doubts it was going to happen, but we're here. And Paul Evans, also known as Leonard, he is implementing this in Perl right now. But we have an entire team which was behind this. This isn't everyone. These are a lot of the major people. If I forgot someone, please. Uh, I apologize for that, and I'm not going to go over that. But basically, this wasn't me saying, this is how we should do it. This was them telling me, no, you got it wrong. And we had to go back and revisit things over and over again and refine this until we got something that we felt was comfortable and felt like Pearl at the same time. And if you've not seen Karina today, this is not going to be a tutorial on Karina, actually. We're not going to be talking about Karina a huge amount here. We can declare a proper class, and that is a class. It is also, it creates a package effectively. It's entered into the namespace, but that's a proper class. We have instance variables. We have true methods. The intent is that you can drop a sub in there and you cannot call a subroutine as a method. It will know the difference between the two. It understands the invocants. We don't put self in there because it knows that it's there for you. <laughs> There was uh, some code I was working on a few months ago, huge, huge package, and it was dealing with cookies and trying to work around some issues with cookies, and the first argument to everything was cookie, and it took me a while to realize it was a class, not procedural code, because they had decided to name the invocant of the cookie class cookie instead of self. And when you're working on the code and you don't realize that you're working on an instance of the code that you're looking at, I was trying to find out where is this method defined in this other class, and I couldn't. No, I'm looking at it. So this consistency is important. So instead of bless and isa, when I interview new Perl developers today, I'm astonished how many times I've asked them, how do you inherit from another class in Perl? I use extends. Uh, I use parent. Uh, many of them don't know about the isa array anymore. 
I'm really surprised. If you're not familiar with this, bless and is a basically, bless basically says, okay, we now have a very unusual calling syntax for subroutines, and we're going to call them methods. And is a says, we have more methods. That's it. You want encapsulation? That's up to you. You want state? That's up to you. You want anything else? You, you've got to build it all yourself. And Karina basically says, we're going to try and go through and build the things that most people want and make them native to the language now, instead of you having to figure out how to make it happen. And we just have four keywords. Class, role, field, and method. That's it. All of this comes through just four keywords. And you might wonder, how did we get such an expressive OO syntax out of just four keywords? Because of the Kim syntax. That came from Damian Conway. He was working with us on the design, and he happened to notice there was a lot of inconsistencies in the design. Some things which were should have been modifying keywords were actually keywords themselves, or sometimes they were modifiers. That we had all sorts of odd little edge cases within there. And once he spotted this and he provided us with a more normalized syntax, I named it Kim. Keyword identifier modifier. And the grammar just looks like this the, at the top level. Keyword identifier, optional modifiers, optional setup. And in fact, later on, I want to make the identifier optional. Why? What about anonymous classes? That could be interesting. I I need to double check. I believe object pad offers anonymous methods. Karina should too. What would an anonymous field look like? I need to think about that for a while because that could be some interesting things with object construction, but I don't know yet. But we're keeping it simple for right now, so the identifier is not optional. So here's a keyword. In this case, we just showing the keywords for the class and the field, highlighted in red, bold. The identifier is the class name or the field variable name. Modifier is a colon param, which says max size can be passed as a parameter to the constructor. And then we have the setup. The cache automatically defaults to hash ordered new. And max size, if you do not pass it in the constructor, it's going to default to 20 in this particular case. I've also highlighted, it's hard to see, the uh, parentheses after cache LRU to show that the body of the class is how you set up the class. I tend to show my examples for Karina with a postfix block. This is not required. You can do class, class name, semicolon, and then have your block in line if you prefer things that way. And here's where we're at right now. As of 538, released just a few days ago, we have classes, inheritance, field initializer blocks, and for convenience attributes, that's partially done because we have the colon param in there. So we're finally getting the beginning of this actually physically in the Perl core, physically, yeah, in the Perl core right now, so you can start playing around with it. I think when six of those are done, not counting the mop, that's going to handle 80% of the cases that people have. The MOP is for people who want to start doing dynamic stuff. That's a meta object protocol like you would have in Moose. Very handy. Um, and that's the point where more people are going to come back to us and say, these are the mistakes you made, and we can start looking at them and figuring out what we're going to do about that. But like all those other language examples that I showed you, you have to learn how to work with it, not fight against it. And in some cases, it's going to be new idioms. I have seen cases where people have said, Karina's broken this way. And I've looked at their code, and that's actually very bad object-oriented design, which is easy to do currently, but we want to avoid that now. Sometimes it's, okay, that looks like it really is a limitation of Karina, but we need to explore this area a little bit more to figure out the best way to push forward. Most of what you do is supported, but <clears throat> it's like the Pareto rule. 80% of the results come from 20% of the actions. Now we have to do the last 80% to get the next 20. It's not going to be fun. But the principle of parsimony. This is probably the single most important slide in here about Karina. If you haven't seen me talk about this before or write about this, I want you to keep this in mind. The idea was, and this is right on the front page of the Karina spec, we want to keep things as simple as possible with the idea that when it comes time to change things, we haven't painted ourselves into a corner. So that when we change things, instead of breaking Karina, we will extend it. For example, what if we decide we need multiple inheritance? I can't imagine that we do. But if we decide we need multiple inheritance, we could add it if we wanted to. But if we do that, 
we allow single inheritance right now. We're just extending it. We're not breaking it. Or what if we decide uh, right now you cannot inherit from a non-class object? So if you instantiate a new version of CGIPM, whatever, Karina doesn't know that CGI can be treated like a class, and it says you can't inherit from a non-Karina object or a non-class object or something like that. I can't remember the exact error message. Why did we do that? There's a lot of reasons why it could be very problematic to try and inherit from something which is not already a Karina object. If we change this in the future, it means people won't have been reliant on that behavior, and we can extend it rather than break it. Whereas if we realize later on that inheriting from a non-Karina object was a really bad idea, we can't take that away without breaking code. So we have striven very, very hard to make sure that we can extend it without breaking it. And that's, there's one example I can think of, which is a counterexample. I wanted the postfix block. I wanted that to be mandatory so that we could loosen that up afterwards. And everyone on the design team just shot me down. Well, I don't know if everyone did, but I think most of them did. They were not happy with me. And I lost that argument. And that's OK, because as the lead designer, this wasn't really my idea. I picked this up from Stephen Little and so many others. And I tried to put it together, and I was pushed it through. But I didn't want to be the dictator on this. So a lot of compromises were made on this. And in fact, Karina is missing a lot of things that I felt were extremely important. But it's because, as a team, we came together and agreed on this stuff. I am willing to bet no one knows who this man is. Pardon? Holy crud. <laughs> For those who didn't hear on the video, he said he thinks that's Dr. Michelle Koenig. Which, in fact, it is. <clears throat> He's a mathematician, computer scientist. Uh, he does a lot of work in security and privacy. He's been programming longer than most of us have been alive. Uh, in the 1960s, he was working for, oh, I can't remember, like IBM or Intel or something like that. And they had a problem where divers going down, uh, they, had a, they had to breathe in helium as they go down deep enough under the water. And when they're talking back up to the, to the boat above them, their voices got higher and higher and higher and higher. And then it got to the point where you couldn't understand them after a while. And they went to Dr. Koenig and said, can you help us with this? And he said, well, uh, yeah, that's trivial. All you have to do is, no, we already tried that. Because back in the 60s, computers really were not real time for handling stuff like this. They were slow. Uh, a couple of years ago, I replicated some code that I had written in 1987. And it ran about 2 million times faster. Now imagine 20 years before that. Computers were slow, and he worked on this for quite some time, and eventually figured out a way of doing that transformation to bring the, adjust their voice down to where it was intelligible in a very fast way. And he actually, he got published in France, he won an award, and he discovered recently that in quantum computer research, they're using that work. Ariane 5, heavy lift rocket, one of the most reliable rockets of all time, why is it so reliable? In part because of software that this man built. The guy's a genius. He's also my next door neighbor. <laughs> and just an incredibly nice guy. So we're sitting down uh, a while ago. We're having dinner. And after dinner, we have drinks because that's what you do. And we're talking about data and privacy. And he works with this a lot. He understands it really well. And we're talking about so does everyone here know what GDPR is, roughly? OK, so basically, uh, Europe says you must treat people's data very nicely, or else you're in very, very serious trouble if you get it wrong. Uh, there's also PCI, Payment Compliance Standard for the credit card industry, PII, Personally Identifiable Information, the right to be forgotten, numerous state laws getting passed about this. Politicians are sitting up taking notice because people are getting mad. They're tired of corporations leaking their data. They're tired of corporations abusing their data. They're tired of opening up an image, a browser in private mode and searching for something, and then all of a sudden advertisements for that thing are showing up. People do not like the fact that their information is getting abused. So politicians are paying attention, but they're not passing laws quickly enough because it's not always clear what laws have to be passed yet. It's hard to deal with, and there's a lot of costs associated with this. I call up a company, or I send an email to a company saying, I don't want you to have my data anymore. How much money do they have to spend to delete all of my data, if they can? 
So there's a lot of costs involved in that. And personnel, like if you have a large enough company in Europe, you have to hire a data protection officer who makes sure that, you know, your GDPR stuff is being done correctly. And, you know, there's a reputation problem. If you mishandle people's data and this gets to be public, that could hurt your company. These are a lot of costs these companies are bearing. And it's not actually a direct benefit to them. And it's often a detriment to you. But the companies do not want to have to bear these costs. And they often don't care that you like cherry syrup with your pancakes. They might care if people in this demographic like cherry syrup with their pancakes. But they often don't even care about your specific data. They just want the aggregate data for driving their business. And then the threats they have to deal with. Thank you. So we're talking about uh, compliance costs, which are extremely high to implement a lot of this stuff. GDPR bankruptcy. I read about a taxi company, which they were recently fined 2 million euros because their software developers did not go to my how to fake a database design talk, and they used the customer's phone number as a primary key in the database. And they couldn't delete the primary key. So boom, 2 million euro fine. Meta recently received a 1.2 billion euro fine for violating GDPR. And as more and more countries start looking at that saying, oh, maybe we can punish Meta. That's going to start adding up after all. Companies are getting worried about this. It's really becoming a problem. PCI violations. Worst case on violating PCI, credit card companies can say, you cannot process our data anymore, and boom, you're out of business. They don't even need to fine. They're just going to deny you. And there's not much you can do about that. So Michelle asked me a very interesting question. What if I could loan them my data? What if I could loan them my data, and when I've decided they can't have it anymore, I say that, and there's nothing they do, boom, it's gone. I, we're, we're having drinks. I'm laughing at them. Ha ha, silly. I've worked in the industry for a long time. They actually already have your data. You can't just take it away from them. He's a mathematician, computer scientist, been working in this field for a long time, longer than most of us have been alive. I should have known better. But you might wonder, how can you do this? So I'm going to start lying to you. Because I, I can't tell you how he actually did this. He sent me a paper, and I was shocked at how easy it was. But just to get your mind thinking a little bit differently, here's one thing you could possibly do. So back in uh, 1996, a uh, gentleman invented something called lattice-based cryptography, which is really interesting because, in theory, it cannot be broken by quantum computers. It's really slow. But it is a way to get past the problem with quantum computers just destroying all of our security. And you might know that one of the problems we have with security today with encryption is you send me your data encrypted. I take your data. I decrypt it. I perform the calculations. I get the result. I encrypt it. I send it back to you. But there's that state on my system where it's unencrypted. And what do I do with it when it's unencrypted? Well, I might be saving it to a database. I might be writing it out to log files. Or I might be throwing an exception and automatically having your personal data written out to our ticketing system. This, there's all sorts of problems with that by the decryption of data. And in 2006, Craig Gentry invented with lattice-based cryptography something called homomorphic encryption, whereby you could actually manipulate the encrypted data without decrypting it. Amazing stuff. It's rather limited in what I can do. It's slow. But this is not how he did it. I just want to show you that get you thinking that there is a way something like this potentially could be done. So I'm going to stop the lies right now. He sent me his paper, and I was shocked at how easy this was, if you understand the trick. It's like a magician. They're doing something magical, and like, oh, my goodness. And then they show you the tricks. Like, wow, that's kind of a letdown. But you got to think of the trick first. And if you don't think of the trick first, then, well, it's hard. And I thought I could do a prototype in Perl. Think about all the costs associated with this. Think about all the threats associated with this. You cannot afford to get this wrong. It's not going to happen in Perl. And there's several reasons it's not going to happen in Perl. Specifically, one, I can't tell you because that gives away the trick. Um, but it's, a, it's going to happen sooner or later. If his software doesn't do it, someone else is going to do this because it is so important. There's so much pressure in this area. Two, there's some performance considerations, very high volumes of data. Perl might not be the best fit. But three, you can't afford to screw this up. And part of that's because of data integrity. You have to make sure that the data you're passing around at every step of the process has to be exactly the data that you're expecting. And Perl really doesn't have that. 
Pearl also suffers from a lack of trust. I go into a lot of clients. We're building new Pearl software for people. We're upgrading their old Pearl software for people. And a lot of clients, they're saying, we need you to help us kill Pearl because they're struggling to manage big systems. And it's not just because of lack of developers. It's because Pearl is kind of sloppy in big systems. So yeah, I should have put that up there, sorry. It's, it's a problem we have. And so he obviously said, no, you're not gonna do a prototype in Pearl. He wrote his prototype in Java, and it works just fine, blazingly fast. If any business is curious, talk to me and I can introduce you to Michelle and you can find out how it works. He's, he's just brilliant. But let's think about Pearl 5 for a moment. If you think about what was done with that, it was a rewrite of Pearl 4 and gave you objects, references, lexicals, modules. Why was it done? Yeah, we did need it. Greater scalability of the language, easier to build large scale systems and manage them. Since that time, what large scale features have been built into Perl to help that problem space? <sighs> yep, goose egg. Nothing. We, Perl 5 took off and became the dominant language on the web. It was the duct tape of the internet. And it would not have happened if Larry had not added these features. So for Perl 7, there's some talk that maybe Karina will be part of Perl 7. The uh, Perl Steering Council has talked about this. Others have talked about this. I don't know if that's what's going to happen. <coughs> but to a certain extent, I've stopped thinking about Perl 7. What do we want in Perl 8? And I, th this is my small list. I've actually got a whole bunch of other ideas that I've thought about, but I just I wanted to just brainstorm with myself uh, <laughs> for a while to figure out what what can we have in Pearl Eight. What could really be interesting? And I started thinking about Pearl Five. What made Pearl Five so successful? All these new language spanning features, which made Pearl Five suitable for larger systems, and frankly. A lot of the large systems which were being built at that time are nowhere close to the large systems we have today. So Perl 5 was brilliant for what it did, but I don't think it was possible to anticipate the future of what Perl was going to become. So this is what I think we need. I'm not going to get into applications right now. That has something very specific to do with I go into a client, I set up my environment, bam, I have a duplicate of their environment and I'm not talking about Docker. Oh, for the love of God, I'm not talking about Docker. But data types, I want to think about that. This is what was in Perl 5, Perl-doc-fmy, my type var list. Larry understood a lot about what we needed for building larger systems. If you think he's only a Perl developer, no. He understands a lot of what's going on, but I, I can't say what his motivation was. I couldn't read his mind. I didn't talk to him about this, but why didn't we get that fully fleshed out at the time? And I think the idea was it was a placeholder. It was a promise to the future, a promise we haven't been able to keep yet. It's being used very briefly in like the fields, fragments, some other stuff, but very, very mildly. It's sitting there waiting for us. So I figured I'd play around with this idea. And a lot of people have played around with this idea. And I'm sure many of you have seen these discussions online about what we could possibly do there. So think about this. My int array equals four, five, six. And then array one, we assign it a string and it blows up. So many other languages, that's natural. Absolutely, perfectly natural thing. And it makes sense. We don't have that kind of data control. <clears throat> but let's look at a simple, least recently used cache. Uh, it's a caching strategy when you have an uneven distribution of cache hits in your system. I won't go into details. Basically, when I used to use smaller examples for Karina, people have said, we don't do that in the real world. So I needed something large enough to actually be useful, small enough to fit in a slide. But most people aren't using Karina yet. So let's look at this in Corporal using Bless. Uh, that's what the LRU cache would look like at that point. I'm not going to go into details about the class because that's not the important thing. thing is, it's very easy to misuse this class. For example, 
we have a max size. You can't have more than X number of entries. What happens when we pass a reference to max size? Well, that gets interesting because that reference is going to be treated as the integer value of the address of the reference, and the max size of your class is going to, of your cache is going to cause you a very, very bad day because you will run out of memory in your cache pretty darn quickly. Cache set. What if I get the key and value backwards and I'm storing hash refs in there? That would silently succeed because I don't have control over the data unless I remember to manually write that in or cache get hash reference, that's going to fail, but it's going to fail for the wrong reasons. Not because the data wasn't there, but because you asked for it the wrong way. And most of these things, if you check your data, they can be fixed. And I have had people say, I don't need to worry about those kind of data checks because I don't write code like that. And I know of at least one person who told me that, and I looked at their CPAN modules, and I saw little checks all over the place. How many arguments do I have? Is this actually an integer? And they're act they were actually writing the code for that and then asserting that they did not need to do so. so. But when you're just writing a quick script or something or a little prototype, you don't need that. It's true. You don't. You're just kind of testing an idea. You're playing with it. But others call your code. And I guarantee you they're not always calling it correctly. You work on big systems, and you will see this all the time. Someone's calling your code with data in a format you didn't expect, or you're returning data in a format that they didn't expect. This happens all the time. It's the boundaries between your code and theirs where we really need these data checks in there. But again, this is make-believe. We don't have this. So if we look at this, let's, let's imagine what this might look like if we had data checks in there. Notice I'm not calling it types. I'll explain why. So here, just taking out the code, just listing the data checks up there. For the constructor, we assert that the class has to be a class, not an instance, a class of cache LRU, and an unsigned integer for max size. By the way, you might think max size should be a positive integer, but if you allow a zero in there, that's a quick and easy way to disable your cache when everything goes wrong. Uh, I thought about that. I had to rewrite my slides after I realized I had my type wrong on that. Sorry, my check wrong on that. Max size. We're calling it with a, the invocant must be an object of cache LRU, and it returns an unsigned integer. By the way, none of this code can work because these are not allowed in signatures at all. Set, we call set key value. Set the object, the invocant has to be an object of cache LRU, string key, and we're going to just assert that it's a defined value. And that returns an object, cache LRU. In other words, it returns a the invocant, so you can chain your mutators if you want to, or you're allowed to call it in void context if you wish. We're down here for get. Again, you have to call an instance of the object, and you have to pass a string for the key, and you cannot call it in void context because fetching something from the cache in void context is almost certainly a bug. And when I look at this, I think, kind of sucks. That's a lot of typing. I don't want all that typing. And if I've got a large code base, I don't want that all over the place. So just add it for the places where you think it's going to be a problem. There, I'm, I'm just not going to skip it on my invocant. No one gets that wrong, right? So I'm just going to assert that the unsigned integer for my constructor has to be, uh, max size has to be an unsigned integer. For the set, I'm going to say it has to be a string and the value has to be defined and get. It's just going to take a string, and I'll go ahead and toss an not void on there. Or if I was using Karina, because Karina checks the invocants for you, it becomes all nice and simple, and that's actually not difficult. Not possible. Perl parser literally does not allow this right now. Just out of curiosity, if this was available right now, how many of you would use this in your code? Okay. I don't think the camera can see that, but most of the people held their hands up. It's called Project Ocean. Ocean. Ocean was an Arisha, Arisha uh, a deity of the Nigerian Yoruba. She's a, a river deity, fertility goddess. In the story, she's listed as someone who is a kind of a protector or a savior. Uh, and if that's not hubris, I don't know what is, but that's what I'm uh, not hubris for her. It's hubris for me, borrowing her name. Uh, and I chose her as opposed to some other things because I was tired of, oh, let's always pick a white European name for this. This project was originally Heimdall for a Norse god. 
Ocean will protect your data. So Sina Pazun deep. Why? Computer scientists have art have reasonable disagreements on what a type system is. Computer programmers have screaming matches. I don't want screaming matches. Okay. Thank you. The man on the left is a computer scientist. Most of you probably know him, Dr. Damien Conway. The man on the right is not a computer scientist. I was found, had to go to the bathroom at one place. I dodged, dodged into a pub and found myself inexplic inexplicably starring in a Terminator-themed adult film. It was very awkward. Ocean history. Uh, basically, in December 23, 2022, I wrote a gist about here's what I'd like to see out of a type system for Perl. This time I'm saying type because what I wanted was something much closer to my vision. But I knew I wasn't capable of doing something like that. So I sent an email to Damien. And the basic process to get something like this in core is called a Perl proposed change. You send a pre-PPC email to the list. And you say, this is the problem. Here's my proposed solution. And the next step is invariably, no, it has to be a CPAN module first. Damien's first design arrived on January 9th, 2023. Months of discussion going back and forth, trying to make that work. Uh, this was mostly a very private discussion. We brought in uh, others to talk about it. Uh, Brian, you're in, the, uh, sorry, Ingi, my apologies. Ingi is, was here somewhere. Okay, Ingi right there. He, he was coming in, and uh, Ingi, you like some of the changes, by the way. Um, so Damien wrote data checks. It is not on the CPAN, but it looked like this. Data checks, we used attributes instead of the my type var list syntax because we were afraid that P5P would be concerned about backwards compatibility. Turns out that's probably not a problem. But that actually mostly works the way you expect it. We have uh, almost 200,000 tests. It's in oh, GitHub, Ovid slash Ocean. It was a private repository for a long time. It's now been opened up. Uh, it has 24 built-in checks. We have defined, we've spec'd out user-defined checks. We've spec'd out coercions. And this is the team which is currently working on this. By the way, even though the repository was private, the project itself was not. I had been discussing it on Perl 5 Porters, and there was a lot of discussion, a lot of interest, and it was going to, overwhelmed the list. It wasn't appropriate. And I said, look, send me your GitHub user ID. I will add you as a collaborator. No questions asked. And then we had a lot of discussion there. It will give us safer code. It will help keep Perl 5's promise of my type var list. And it's also self-documenting. Karina is partially implemented in the Perl core right now. Um, and it is going to be difficult for us to anticipate all of the differences from how we used to program to how we're going to be programming now. But data checks, maybe they're coming. I'm not making any promises, but I am pushing the project, trying to see if we can get something that the P5P group will accept that we can move into the core. We have working code right now, but it's based upon attributes. And it's not going on the CPAN because it is as alpha as alpha can get. But that is what I've been doing. I'm still trying to push forward. I think it could be one of the major things which can really help to stabilize a lot of what we have for Perl. There's a lot more that we need, but I just wanted to give you an update. So I thank you very much for your time. Pete, do I have any time for questions? Okay, very brief time for questions, if anyone has any. Yes. Okay, the question was, the Perl compiler already has a working module up on the CPAN to provide something similar to this, and it's been up there for a while. How am I going to work to bring in a type system? First of all, these are not types. These are data checks. 
Um, and it is different from what I've seen in the Pro Compiler. It's not just the simple things you can map down to the CPU level. These are also user-defined types. Sometimes they can be quite complex. We have examples in there about creating uh, monotonic variables, bijective hashes, uh, you know, create, you know, like a UUID type, all sorts of interesting stuff, which I wasn't seeing, and I could be mistaken in that. Uh, and also coercions, there's a lot of stuff specced out in there. But all you have to do is send me your GitHub username, or actually, no, the, the thing's open now. You can go ahead and join and start discussing it there in the discussions, raise an issue, whatever, and we can start finding a way to move forward if that's appropriate there. But this isn't just me. I'm, I'm not the one who makes the call. There's a team working on that. Any other questions? Do I have more time? Any other questions? OK, thank you. No more questions. That's it. Oh, yes. Now, the seven steps. OK, there you go. Any other questions? No one's curious about data checks at all. I thought that would be interesting to folks, especially when most of you held up your hands and said you'd use it. Ingi. I'm sorry, could you repeat your question? I'm a bit hard of hearing. It is public right now in Ovid slash Ocean. Uh, I will move forward to that. Where is it? Um, there, github.com slash Ovid slash Ocean. It's public. Um, with some of your earlier concerns, we had discussed in that gist long before this was created in its final form, you were concerned about attributes and you wanted something kind of mirroring what we saw in other languages a lot closer. It's probably going in that direction. So that's an argument that I, I think you very much won and I, I'm grateful for that. Oh, no worries. And we tended to over explain a lot of stuff. It was very, very hard to keep up. <laughs> Yes. Speaking of which, um, Damien apologizes. He, even though he did a huge amount of work on this and a lot of it's built on some past experience he has with building systems like this, he can't continue in the project because of other things which are going on in his life right now. So he's very much supportive of it. He might be able to answer email about it, but he's not making any promises. I, I think the general consensus is yes, we will likely move to the my type varless syntax, but even that won't work because you can't use that inside of signatures. So things about the Perl parser will, would have to change. But there's a still there's still room to help decide some of this, to nail down some of the semantics. Uh, so his question was, are we gonna use attributes or not? Uh, basically, or are we gonna use the my type varless syntax, well, the my type varless syntax? Uh, there's still a lot of room for clarifying some of the edge cases there. I don't want people to be aware of that, so please feel free to come in. Okay, what you're asking for is basically, are we specifying the data checks on the variable or the contents of the variable? And it's very much on the variable itself. And I don't have the time to go into the reason why, but basically that helps to keep the scope of the check in place. So if a variable escapes a particular scope, uh, you'll it won't break other code. So the changes will be lexical. That does have other impacts on the system though, which I don't have the time to discuss, unfortunately. But feel free to ask me afterwards. Um, 
Uh, hey, one more. Yes. I I didn't. Damien did. <laughs> How did we get two hundred thousand tests? Yes, Damien. Uh, basically, what he did was he wrote very high level tests to assert that a lot of the stuff was correct. But he wrote this on top of his a testing system he built for this, which did a lot of lower level tests, which are harder to see. So you might see just a few tests in a file, but it runs tons. So, thank you very much for your time. Feel free to ask me questions afterwards if you like. <laughs>